Clancy Pasta presents, my new coat is warm, stylish, and full of awful mysteries. Written by N.S. Lewis and narrated by Clancy. Nothing dies. You are stardust and god and rat viscera. The big one. You're ridiculous, said Kim, as I tore off a strip of duct tape with my teeth. What? I said, sticking one end of the tape onto one flap of my jacket and patting it down tight. You're going to drive yourself to the store, said Kim. Today, right now, and buy yourself a new coat. I drew the jacket closed and patted the other end of the tape onto the other flap. Why? I said. This one's fine. Even I had a hard time swallowing that, though. Two years ago, the zipper had jammed up and broken irreparably. The Velcro clasps had worked for a surprisingly long time, but had eventually failed, and now I was down to using duct tape to keep the thing closed. Kim just glared at me. All right, I said. I guess it is time for a new one. I've got a full day, though. Really, that was a bit of a stretch. I didn't really have any Sunday plans at all, and was just about to go out for a little walk. The truth was that I hated to do shopping of any kind. Can't you pick one out for me? I'll leave you my card to pay for it. Excuse me? said Kim. I must have misheard you, because I thought that I heard my husband, a grown-ass 36-year-old man, ask me to do his clothes shopping for him as if I were his mother, and he were still a whittle wed bedding schoolboy. She was done playing around then. I am a dumb man, but there is a limit to my dumbness. What I said was, absolutely, yes, I'm on my way right now to go get a new coat. That's what I thought you said. She was sounding a little less dangerous now. And pick me up some maxi pads while you're out, she added. I'm not a fashionable man by any stretch, but even I could tell that the black coat I stumbled across in my local thrift store was downright stylish, and only 20 bucks. I tried it on and it fit perfectly, like it was made just for me. I paid, wore it out of the store, and was amazed at how warm it kept me against the winter wind. It even had a detachable hood that I pulled up over my head. When I got home, Kim was legitimately impressed. She wasn't even mad that I had forgotten the maxi pads. What brand is that? She asked. It looks expensive. I leaned forward, grinning like an idiot, so she could check the tags. Only 20 bucks, I said proudly. As she did that, I got a beer and plopped down in my chair. I still had my coat on. It was just so damn comfortable. My little girl Anna woke up from her nap and when she saw me sitting there in my new puffy black coat, she ran down the hallway and jumped right on me. It's soft, she cooed, nuzzling her face on into the coat. The coat, I decided, was a definite hit all around. That night, Kim kicked me awake. You didn't turn off your ringer, she accused. And who the hell is calling you at 3 a.m.? Through the haze of half-sleep, I heard a phone ringing from the living room. It wasn't my usual ringtone, but sometimes the thing went haywire and converted back to factory settings. Or something, I don't know. I couldn't keep up with that shit anymore. Sorry, honey, I mumbled. It'll stop in a minute. I closed my eyes and started to drift back off. Kim kicked me again. It's not stopping, she said. It's going to wake Anna up and then I'll never get back to sleep. It was another one of those do or die moments for me. If I didn't get my ass out of bed right then and stop the ringing, my ass was grass. I made an impossible effort and got out of bed. I felt mostly sorry for myself at first, but with each half stumbled step down the hallway, as the phone rang on and on, my rage was building. Whoever was on the other end of that line was about to get the lesson of a lifetime on civility and basic human decency. 
I made it to the living room and reached out in the dark to the windowsill where I charged my phone at night. I grabbed it roughly, yanked the charger out of its port, and stared at the screen. It was black. I powered it on and stared in bewilderment to see that nobody was calling me. And yet, a phone rang on. For a moment, I got an ugly thrill, thinking that it was actually Kim's phone ringing. When it came to things like this, I was almost always in the wrong, and Kim almost always let me know it. I guessed it would be nice to turn the tables on her for once. But no, I thought. That's not right. Kim kept her phone on her nightstand and religiously set it to do not disturb before going to sleep. The ringing was definitely coming from the living room. I followed the sound to the dark outline of my chair. That's when it hit me. The ringing was coming from inside of my coat. I had finally gotten too warm wearing it in the house that afternoon, and it slung it over the back of my chair where it rested still. I reached in the front pockets, but nothing was there. Then I felt around the inside, and I found it. A small pocket that I hadn't noticed before. I reached in, and just as my hand closed around something, the ringing stopped. I stood there in the sudden silence, in my undies, with my hand inside the coat. I got the heebie-jeebies, that feeling there's something there in the darkness. I yanked the object from the pocket and held it up to my face. Sure enough, it was a phone. A prehistoric Motorola flip phone. I flipped it open and the screen, backlit by that sickly green light, showed a missed call. I squinted. The call was from the small one. I shook my head turned off the ringer, and threw the phone on the coffee table. I crept down the hallway back to my bedroom and was relieved to see that Anna had not woken up and squirmed into our bed. I had done the quick mental calculations. Even though it wasn't my phone, the whole thing was still my fault for not checking the code over thoroughly enough. Who the fuck was that? said Kim sitting upright and alert against the headboard. The small one, I said, lowering myself down onto that beautiful bed. Who the fuck is the small one? she asked. Dunno, honey, I said, closing my eyes. In the morning, I sat in my chair and tried to call the small one back, to no avail. Just keeps ringing, I said. No voicemail or anything. Well, said Kim from the kitchen, flipping a pancake. Try the contacts. The phone obviously still has service. I'm sure somebody's missing it. It's a ghost phone, said Anna, in her five-year-old voice, looking up from her video. That freaked me out a little when she said that. There's no such thing as ghosts, kiddo, I said. What kind of video are you watching over there anyway? Avery saw one in his room, Anna said. Avery was a kid from kindergarten. Avery saw a pile of clothes in the corner of his room or something like that, I said, trying to navigate the ancient Motorola. At last, I figured out how to open the contact screen. Her skin was falling off, said Anna. You hearing this sh this stuff, honey? I called into the kitchen. I shook my head and scrolled through the contacts on the phone. It didn't take long. There were only four of them. The bad one. The big one. The good one. The small one. Well, that gave me the proper heebie-jeebies. I mean... Everybody uses little nicknames in their contacts, but there was something about the combination of those names, and the fact that it was only those names. No mom, or Bill from work, or anything else. That just got to me. I flipped the phone shut and tossed it on the coffee table. 
Well? Asked Kim, coming into the room with plates of pancakes. Any luck? Nah, I said, taking a plate. Thanks. You tried the whole contact list? She asked doubtfully. I speared a chunk of pancake on my fork and sloshed it around in syrup. Look, I, I don't think I want to get involved in this, honey. It's just a shh. It's just a junky old phone from, like, the 90s. It's not worth it. It's a ghost phone, said Anna again. Jesus, I wish she'd stop with that shit. Did you even try to call anybody? Kim asked. I tried the small one, I said defensively. Well, try a couple more. And if nobody picks up, just leave a message and take the phone with you to work. If we don't hear anything by the end of the day, we'll forget it. I finished breakfast and then begrudgingly picked up the phone again. I knew who I was going to try to call first. I brought up the good one, punched the green phone button, and listened as it rang and rang and rang. Finally, I hung up frowning. The big one was next, with the same result. I flipped the phone shut and nervously tapped it on my knee. I looked over to see Kim looking at me with one eyebrow raised. I sighed, opened the phone, and dialed the bad one. On the second ring, somebody apparently picked up. Hello? I said, watching as Kim leaned forward from the couch. This is going to sound weird. There are pockets within pockets. Hissed a voice on the other end. It sounded possibly male, but really more like a snake than a human. I went cold. This isn't who you think it is, I said. This isn't who you think it is repeated the hissing voice, and then I heard a click. Call terminated. I pulled the phone away from my ear and stared at it. Well, said Kim. It's a ghost phone, said Anna. You, I said, glaring at my daughter. Get your ass in your room and get dressed for school, now. My wife and daughter looked at me with shocked faces. Now, I said. Anna got up and ran to her room. What the fuck was that about, said Kim. You better have a good reason for talking to Anna like that. She didn't do anything wrong. Going on about ghosts like that, I said, quietly now. Ghosts aren't real. What happened on the phone? It sounded like you reached somebody. I laughed a little crazily, because I didn't quite know what else to do. Oh, I got somebody. What did they say? He, or she, or it, said there are pockets within pockets, and that's about it. This phone must come from the loony bin, or something. They let the patients have phones that only the orderlies can contact. Something like that. That improvised explanation all of a sudden actually made a lot of sense to me. That's what this is, I said, feeling a lot more at ease now. Huh, said Kim, growing thoughtful now. That is weird. Well, your coat, said Kim, jumping up from the couch. Your coat, there's a hidden pocket in there. Look, I said, frowning, suddenly realizing without a doubt that she was right. Maybe the whole coat thing was a bad idea. But it was no use. She was already at the coat rack, pawing away at the damn coat. She turned the front pockets out and looked at them closely. There's something in here, she said, 
pointing to one of the outturned pockets. Something sewn into the pocket. Kim picked the code off the hook and started running it into the kitchen. Wait, I said. Kim stopped running. Don't you want to know what it is? She asked, her eyes wide with excitement. That call I made, I said slowly. It was to someone called the bad one. The bad one. Kim laughed. So? She said. What do you think is going to happen when we cut this open? A ghost's going to fly out? I saw Anna come out of the hallway, all dressed for school, looking sullen, and I felt terrible about yelling at her before. I choked down my unease with the whole situation and nodded to Kim. Ghosts aren't real, Mama. Go ahead and cut it open. Papa! Papa! said Anna, her sullenness already forgotten and replaced with a look of wonder. Yeah, kiddo? Did the ghost phone tell you to cut the coat open? I sighed. Yeah, kiddo. The ghost phone told me to cut my coat open. A moment later, my wife came out of the kitchen holding a folded square of paper in her hand. What is it? asked Anna. Let's find out, said Kim, unfolding it on the coffee table. I didn't feel so good. As the paper opened up, we saw what was scrawled out across it. It was a hand-drawn map. It looked to depict a shoreline with a few large rocks and a forest at the edge of the beach. Right in the middle of the forest was... X marks the spot, said Anna. I didn't know much for certain about life. I didn't know if God existed or if we were anything beyond worm food when we died. I didn't know if I'd voted for the right person in the last election, or if I'd vote for the right one in the next. I didn't know if I'd make it to the next election, or if I'd be six feet under by then. But I did know one thing. I knew that I didn't want to get within 10 miles of that fucking X on the map, wherever it was and I knew that I didn't want to find out where it was to begin with. So two things. In that moment, I knew two things for sure. Cool, said Kim. Let's find it. Yay, said Anna. I had a hard time at work, but luckily, it was a slow day. The office phone rang a few times, making me jump every time with people wanting oil deliveries, and a few people came in to pay their bills. I went through the motions like a zombie. I didn't want to, but I kept thinking about that damn map. The location seemed vaguely familiar, and my mind kept searching, seeming to get closer and closer to nailing it down. I had the phone in that same inside pocket where I had found it. I kept taking it out to see if I had missed any messages from the good one. I mean, that's who you want to hear from, right? Not somebody called the bad one, directing you to a secret map. No, you want to hear from the good one, telling you what to do next. By lunchtime, I had really had enough of the whole deal. I drove down to the thrift store where I'd gotten the coat and walked up to the front register. Excuse me, I said to the lady there. I got this coat here yesterday, and it's a great coat. No complaints about the coat itself, at all. But see, there was some personal items inside of it. Is there any chance somebody here could tell me who brought this coat in? I want to make sure they get their stuff back. Nope, said the lady. That's it? Come on. I rubbed my temples in thought. You must have cameras here. Every store does, right? Yeah, we got cameras, said the lady. But they ain't gonna tell you shit. Most folks bring their shitty old clothes in garbage bags. Most of the shit is garbage. 
We dump it all on a table in a big pile with all the other shit and sort through it to find the shit that ain't too shitty to sell. Even if we could tell you whose shit it was, we ain't gonna be telling you. Think about it. You want everyone knowing your shit? Yeah, well, I said. I know that if I left my stuff, my shit, inside of my other shit, I'd want somebody to find me and give me my shit back. She thought it over. What kind of shit is it? She asked. I pulled the phone out of my pocket and set it on the counter. A phone, for starters. She eyed the Motorola. Ain't nobody want that old shit, she said. Well, somebody does, because it's still in service. You try the contact list and shit? I did, I said. Nobody picked up. The lady sighed. Alright, just leave it here. Somebody comes looking for this shit? It's theirs. I hesitated. I have no earthly idea why, but I hesitated. Are you sure you can't just try to find out who the code belonged to? Then I can track them down. Look, mister, I really don't give a shit about any of this. Leave the phone here, or don't, but I ain't about to comb through god knows how many hours of footage to find out who this shitty ass phone belongs to. What is wrong with you? I asked myself. Leave the shit and get the hell out of there. Alright, I said. I don't really give a shit either. I'm leaving it with you. No shit, she said, yawning. She slid the phone across the counter, picked it up, and dropped it in a box on the floor. I walked out of the thrift store feeling ten pounds lighter. Like I uh, just had a good shit. I got in my car, and my phone buzzed. It was a text message from Kim, asking if I'd gotten any calls on the other phone. I was typing out a response, telling her I'd dumped it back at the thrift store, and it's their problem now, when there was a loud bang on the driver's side window. Then I nearly did shit myself. I looked up, my heart up in my throat, and there was the lady from the register, banging away in my window, holding up that damn Motorola. She looked different, somehow. Maybe it was her eyes. They looked glazed over. Against my better judgment, I rolled down the window. There is a call for you, sir, she said. Her voice sounded different. She hadn't sounded very interested in engaging before, sure, but now she sounded totally flat and monotone. Something about her was definitely off. Nah, I said smiling. Don't you remember? That's not my phone. That call can't be for me. I'm quite certain that the call is for you, said the woman. It is the big one. She held the phone out. Reaching through the window, I took it from her and put it up to my ear. Listen, I said. Whatever the hell this is, whoever the hell you are, I'm done with it. Got it? I'm afraid that is incorrect, said a deep, deep voice on the other end. You are in it. Now ask yourself, are you in it to win it? I ain't in shit, I said, winking at the lady and hitting the red button. I handed the phone back to her. Told you it wasn't for me. She held the phone for a moment, and then her head began to shake. Rapidly. Like somebody had jammed a live electric wire into her brain. Blood trickled out of her nose and the corner of her mouth. Then the Motorola started ringing again. Please, she said, in a choked voice as blood now gushed out of her mouth. Answer it. Are you in it to win it? 
asked the big one in that low, booming voice. Shit, I said, still staring in shock at that poor, bloodied woman. Yes. Excellent, said the big one, and hung up. Part 2 I didn't go back into work that day. The lady from the thrift store turned out to be fine. She told me that she'd heard that shitty old phone ringing, and that was the last thing she remembered until she found herself covered in blood, standing next to my car. I told her she slipped on some ice and banged her face real good, and that she should go get that checked out. She said she doesn't have insurance, so I dug a hundred out of my wallet and handed it over. Not enough to get even a damn aspirin pill in the hospital these days, but all I could spare. I got home and flopped in my chair, still wearing my coat. Despite the trouble it had brought me, I still was quite fond of the thing. I thought, well, I'm in it to win it now, but what the hell am I in, and how the hell do I win it? I reached over to the coffee table where the map was still laying open from the morning. I picked the thing up and looked at it. It seemed so familiar. I knew that place, somehow, but I couldn't quite say where it was. Not yet. I would figure it out, though. I didn't want to, but I felt that because I was in it, I didn't have much of a choice, especially not if I wanted to win it. I pulled out the old Motorola, flipped it open, and dialed the good one. The big one and the bad one were clearly assholes, and I was pretty sure that the small one was as well, given the 3am wake-up call. But the good one? The name said it all, right? The phone rang and rang and rang. I decided that the good one was probably an asshole too. I searched around the internet on my phone, trying the names as well as the phone numbers attached to the names. Nothing. And Kim never had found out what company made the coat. It was all a big, fat, terrifying zero. I was totally in the dark. Kim was still at work, so I texted her a quick version, minus the demon possession, or whatever the hell it had been, of what had happened. I'm in it now. I typed. We're in it together, she responded. That made me feel better for a minute, and then it made me feel worse. I didn't want her to get hurt, and I knew that she would insist on coming with me wherever this strange and terrible journey led to. I didn't have much time to ponder the situation before the Motorola rang. I considered just ignoring it. Then I thought back to that poor woman, blood spewing out of her mouth. I looked down and saw that it was the small one, and I flipped the phone open. Something was making a scratching noise on the other end. That was all there was. Hello? I tried. More scratching. Listen, small one. You tell me what the hell is going on here, or so help me... The line went dead, and I sat in silence for half a second, before the scratching noise started up again, this time at my front door. Demons, I thought. Claw demons that possess you and make blood spew out of your mouth. I looked around the room in panic for something, anything I could use to fight off a demon. I ran over to the bookcase and began pulling books out hoping for a copy of the Bible, even though I was almost certain that I didn't have one. God damn it, I said. Then I saw a DVD of Mad Max there, on the shelf. It was an insane and desperate train, every single step of the way, and I knew that. But I thought, demons, the Bible, Jesus, Mel Gibson made a movie about Jesus, Mel Gibson is in Mad Max. I grabbed the DVD case and ran over to crouch behind my chair, sweat dripping down into my face. I did a little impromptu prayer. 
Dear God, please bless this DVD and protect me from the demons. I will do anything for you. The scratching continued for a few terrifying minutes, and then stopped. And then I heard... a meow? Yes, there it was again. I crawled slowly across the living room, clutching Mad Max to my chest. I reached the front door and pressed my ear to it and listened. It was the most pathetic meowing I had ever heard, and it definitely sounded like a cat. I stood up and peeked out of the window at the top of my door. I couldn't see anything out there, certainly not a crazed demon. I took a deep breath and opened the door a crack. There at the threshold was the fluffiest gray kitten that I had ever seen. When it saw me, it stopped crying and began purring loudly. Hey there, bud. You get a little lost? I said, bending down and scratching under its chin. It looked up at me with wide eyes. I hope some asshole didn't just leave you here, I said. It meowed. Well, come on in and I'll check with the neighbors, see if we can't figure out where you belong. I opened the door all the way, and the thing walked on in, rubbing up against my leg, its fluffy gray tail sticking straight up like an antenna. I fed it some sliced turkey, which it wolfed right down, then sat down on my chair, scrolling through my contacts for neighbors. The kitten jumped up on my lap, still purring like crazy. Great, I thought. Just what I need. A friggin' cat. The thing dug its little claws into my leg and leapt off of me and onto the coffee table, just a split second before the Motorola started ringing. I cursed, then dug the phone out of my pocket and flipped it open. It was the good one. Finally. I answered the call, and on the other end was just ringing. It just rang and rang and rang like it had each of the times I had tried to call the good one. I hung up in disgust and looked over to see that the cat had pissed all over my coffee table. Bad kitty, I said, picking it up. I carried it into the kitchen where I grabbed a roll of paper towels. I spread out a square of five layers there on the kitchen floor. See that? I said, setting the cat down on the paper towels. That's where you go if you have to go. Got it? The little gray fluff ball looked up at me and started purring again. It followed me, paper towels in hand, back into the living room. I tore off a handful of paper towels to mop up the cat piss, but something stopped me just as I was about to mop it up. It looked like a little river, connecting up with the drawing of the water on the map. Then I knew where it was. When the girls got home, I didn't even try to put up a fight about the kitten. I'd called all the neighbors within a one mile radius, and none of them had heard of a gray fluffy kitten. And yeah, the thing was cute as hell. I can admit that. So we had a cat now. What should we call him? Asked Kim. Wolfie, cried Anna. Hey there, Wolfie, said Kim scratching under his chin as he purred away. I let them get acquainted as I went to the kitchen for a beer. I leaned against the counter, drinking and thinking. I had to go to Liberty Lake alone, and I wanted to do it before it got dark, which didn't leave much time. I didn't want to go, but I had to, and I hoped that would be the end of it. All the business with the this one and the that one and the terrible phone calls. I took a deep swallow as I thought about how there was a good chance that it would also be the end of all of the me business. But I knew these assholes, whatever they were, meant business. And if I didn't go, then that would be the end of me for sure anyway. I went back in the living room and watched my wife and kid play with the kitten. After so many rough years, I had finally arrived at the place I wanted to be. 
I wanted to break down crying and hold on to them tight. It could be the last time, I thought. But that would be no good. I had to play it cool. Why don't you girls go out and get some litter and food for the damn thing, I said. I gotta head over to Jim's. His boiler's acting up. Kim took one look at me and knew that I was full of shit. She walked over to me, grabbed my arm, and dragged me back into the kitchen. What are you not telling me? She demanded. I told her everything. There was no use lying to her. She could smell it from a mile away. I told her that the call from the big one was more scary than I had let on in my text message. I told her about the lady from the thrift store, getting possessed or whatever. I told her about the call from the small one, with the scratching sound. And then the fake call from the good one, with the endless ringing. What else? And I told her that I knew where the map was pointing to. The northeastern end of Liberty Lake. And you thought you'd go running off there alone, huh? Said Kim when I had finished. Well, you're not going, I said. Who takes care of Anna if we both die? And somebody has to go. That's what my gut is telling me. Yes, she agreed. Somebody has to go. And before you told me all of that crazy shit, I thought it would be fun to follow the map. A little game. But no, I know it. There is something evil there, calling for us. For me, I said. Calling for me. But you're not going to go running off there alone, you idiot. I threw up my hands in frustration, spilling a bit of my beer. Who am I going to take, Wolfie? Oh, my poor foolish husband. You're lucky you're cute because you're kind of lacking upstairs, you know? You're going to take the police. Sure, I said, laughing in disbelief. They'll definitely believe that a bunch of demons want us to go to a spot in the middle of the woods. They'll definitely come along. They will, said Kim, because you're not going to tell them anything at all about any demons. You're going to get creative. Or I am. And you're going to just nod your head and look pretty in your new black coat. An hour and a half later, Anna and Wolfie were at home with the sitter, and Kim and I were sitting in Detective Benson's office. Let me see if I have this straight, Benson said, pausing to sip his coffee. You go buy yourself a new coat. Good for you. You get a call in the middle of the night, and it's coming from your coat. There's a phone in there. Calls from a fellow named the big one. No, Kim said. The first call was from the small one. Of course, said Benson, before taking another sip. You miss the call. Next morning, you try the contact list and ring up a fellow by the name of the bad one. He picks up, tells you there's a hidden map in your coat. Okay. Later on, fellow named the big one gives you a ring and tells you that you'd better go to that spot indicated on the map or else. He gives you a description of where you're standing at the moment. You know he's watching you. Later on, the small one calls a second time now, correct? That's right, said Kim. Tells you there's a kitten at your front door, so you open the door and there's a kitten there. Okay. Now you get one more call. Fella by the name of the good one. Only other contact on the phone. Tells you that you have to go to the spot on the map by midnight tonight or else. Or else what? Or else he kills your daughter. Then, a few minutes after the call ends, someone opens your front door. And let me just stop right there for a moment. Why weren't you locking the door at this point? The door had been locked, Kim said. But then I had just gotten home as the call was ending and didn't lock it behind me. We never lock it. I didn't yet know the full story, or I promise you, detective, the door would have been locked. Ah, said Benson, 
jotting something down on his notepad. So somebody opens the front door and chucks in a squirrel with a bullet hole in the center of its head. Is that correct? That's right, said Kim, looking like she was fighting back tears. And then you stuffed the rest of the squirrel in the kitchen sink garbage disposal. That is what I'm hearing? Yes, said Kim, wiping her eyes. I didn't want Anna to see it. Ah, well, that's too bad. Forensic evidence and all that, said Benson. He lifted his coffee cup high and took a long swallow. When he set it down, there was a knock on his office door. Yeah? The door opened and a man stepped in. He looked at Benson, then looked at us, then stood there frowning. Sir, he said uncertainly. Benson sighed. Would you folks give us a moment? Come on, honey, said Kim. Let's go stretch our legs. We left Benson's office and headed over to the water cooler. What do you think that's about? I asked, pouring out a cup and handing it to Kim. She took a sip. They found something. The numbers we gave them. They found something, or... Or? They found nothing, said Kim. When she said that, I got the heebie-jeebies. The door to Benson's office opened again, and the numbers guy walked out and around the corner. Folks, said Benson from the doorway, waving us back in. We went back and sat down again. It sure would be helpful if you let my man borrow that phone for a few. Let him work his magic. No, said Kim. The big one insisted that my husband must have the phone on him at all times. Benson looked down at his notepad. That's right, he said. He drew one hand over his face and tapped the fingers of his other hand on his desk for a few seconds before he started up again. I'll tell you what I can do. I can post a car outside of your house tonight. Probably tomorrow night too, but I gotta be frank here. That's about all I can do without some kind of evidence that somebody means you harm. And even that, well, even that is stretching things a bit. Without evidence, I mean. You don't believe us, said Kim. It's not about whether I believe you or not, as weird and maybe bad as that sounds. It's about what the evidence says, ma'am. Well, you must not believe us, because if you did, then you would understand that my husband has no choice but to go to Liberty Lake tonight, before midnight. Benson frowned. I would strongly advise against that. He doesn't want our daughter to end up like... like that squirrel, said Kim. But I guess it's all the same to you. Damn, she was good. And I gotta say, it was nice watching her use her powers on somebody else for a change. Benson sighed and looked down at his fingernails. I get off duty at 9 tonight. Be at the brew pub at 9.30 unwinding. Might be up for a trip to the lake. Gonna be a full moon tonight, and you can't beat the clear skies out there when it comes to stargazing. Thank you for your time, Detective Benson said Kim, smiling as she stood up. Just doing my duty, said Benson, returning the smile. Then the smile dropped. But if you're jerking me around here, well, things might not end on such a happy note. I stayed in Anna's room for a long time that night, well after she had gone to sleep. My god, she was a precious miracle of beauty and wonderment. I stood up, kissed her forehead, and gently left the room. Kim was in the living room, drinking a glass of wine. It doesn't feel right, I said, lying to Detective Benson. These guys, they're not human. 
I don't know what they are, but they're not human. You'll tell him the truth, said Kim. Once you get to the lake, before you go tromping off into the woods, you'll have the chance to back out, but you'll already be there. Easier to ask forgiveness than permission. You, of all people, should know that, honey, since it's what you do on a daily, if not hourly, basis. I smiled. Kim, I said. I want you to know, if I don't make it back, you'll make it back. Okay, I'll make it back, but all the same, I want you to know I love you. You and Anna, more than anything in the world. I don't know what I'd be without you. Kim laughed. You'd be living in a cardboard box somewhere, I'm sure of it. But yes, I love you too. Forever. I kissed her on the lips, then stood up and put on my coat. From the pocket, the Motorola began ringing. I pulled it out and flipped it open. It was a call from the good one. I answered it. It was just more ringing. It rang and rang and rang. An hour later, Benson pulled his SUV off to the side of the road by the lake. The park was closed, and so the lot wasn't plowed. You ready? asked Benson. Look, I said, looking down at the floor, feeling a lot of different things, all of them bad. I told him the whole story then, the real story. I told him that, as hard as it was to swallow, I felt that we were dealing with the supernatural here. I wouldn't blame it at all if he thought I was crazy, or wanted to back off for any other reason. He listened in silence, and when I finished, he spoke. We are almost there, he said, in a pitch that was at least an octave below his already deep voice. I looked up and over at the driver's seat. Benson's suddenly giant head was now tilted at an angle to avoid being crammed against the ceiling of the SUV. Part 3 You must find the way, said Detective Benson, or the big one, or whatever the hell was sitting next to me scrunched over in the driver's seat. I will follow. I took a deep breath to steady myself. I'd heard that was supposed to help. It didn't. Don't suppose you want to tell me just what's happening here, big guy? What's out there in those woods? What are you? It is time, said the big one. I decided it was definitely the big one, with that deep, booming voice and the bigness. No time like the present, I said, opening the SUV door. Incorrect, said the big one. Oh. I stepped out onto the road. There was a cold wind blowing now, so I put up the hood to my coat and looked around in the moonlight. There, I said, pointing. We beeline it in that direction, we'll make it there. Excellent, said a deep voice from right behind me. For such a big guy, and now I saw that he stood a good eight feet tall, he was a stealthy son of a bitch. I clicked on my flashlight and shone it right into his face. Just tell me this, am I going to die out here? Nothing dies, said the big one. You are stardust and god and rat viscera. Oh, I said. Not very reassured. I shone my flashlight into the forest and got the heebie-jeebies all over again. The woods were dark and they looked poised to turn me back into rat viscera. I started walking, my large friend right at the heels of my muck boots. At first, it was fairly easy going, as the outer edge of the forest had been maintained as part of the park. There were a few overgrown branches that I had to duck while the big one just charged ahead, letting the branches scrape against him and occasionally snap against the force of his body. 
but it was mostly little more than a pleasant stroll. Or as pleasant a stroll as you can have, with some kind of supernatural monster right up your ass, and an unknown fate looming right in front of you. Then the woods got thicker, and any semblance of a path disappeared. My foot sunk into the snow, and when I went to lift it, it snagged on something, and I tumbled face first into a tangle of branches. The branches scratched me to hell as I fell down into the cold ground. Then a pair of hands grabbed me under my arms and lifted me back up. I wiped the snow out of my eyes and turned around to face what I thought would be the big one. But it wasn't. It was Kim. You're almost there, my love, she said. It's very important that you do this. And then she was gone. Poof, and I was alone in the dark woods. For a terrifying moment, I felt lost and directionless. Just shine your light until you find your tracks, I thought, and get this over with. I picked the flashlight up out of the snow until I could see my footprints, and then I trudged onward in the direction that they indicated. It was a strange sensation. I was trusting that past me had known where he was going, even as present me had no idea. As I went deeper into the forest, I started to hear strange noises. Of course I did. I heard a scratching sound, as if some monster was sharpening its claws on a tree just off to my side. I heard a buzzing sound, as if a nest of 10,000 murderous wasps was just a few inches above my head. Then I heard the screaming, off in the distance at first, but growing louder as I moved forward. As the other noises died out, that one grew louder, and I shivered in my coat. Papa, said a little voice behind me. I whipped around, and there was Anna, standing in the dark woods. You have to help them. You have to help us all. Then she was gone. The screaming intensified. It wasn't just one person, but a lot of them. As I got closer, the sound was almost like a physical barrier, thicker than the woods themselves, slowing me down, making me ache. I thought about Kim. I thought about Anna. Hell, I even thought about that little gray cat, Wolfie. And I trudged on inch by painful inch, no longer bothering to move the branches aside or even use my flashlight much, because I was using my hands to cover my ears. It was no good. The screaming seemed to reach the very center of my brain. I closed my eyes to avoid them having scratched out by a patch of branches and pushed myself forward. When I opened them again, I was in the middle of a large clearing, and the screaming had stopped. It didn't make sense. I had taken one step through a mess of branches, and now I was in the middle of a clearing. I shone my flashlight around and saw a big red X spray painted onto the snow. Just beyond it, a shovel was stuck into the ground. I started digging the snow away, and there beneath it was a plastic sandwich bag with something in it. I bent down and looked at it with a flashlight in hand. It was another shitty old Motorola. I took the phone out of the bag, flipped it open, and looked at the contacts. There was only one. The chosen one. I pushed the call button, and the phone inside of my jacket started ringing. I took that one out so that I was now holding both phones. One said that it was calling the chosen one, the other said that it was getting a call from the good one. Aren't you going to answer it? Whispered a thin voice right into my ear. I snapped my head around, but nobody was there. Oh, you can't see me, said the voice. I'm much too small. The small one. Sure, if you like. The phones rang and rang 
and rang. The wheels of my mind spun furiously and inadequately, trying to piece together what was happening. What is this? There is a balance that is far beyond your current capacity to understand. Answer the call, and you will understand. What if I don't? You will, whispered the small one. It has happened before. The hell it has, I said. As you stand here, the balance is broken. To give a trivial example, since we've started this conversation, 106 human beings have died. None have been born, though the balance demanded 214. It came to me in a flash. Because the good one isn't here, I said. You want me to be the good one. I didn't understand it, but somehow I knew it. All you have to do is answer the call, said the small one. To restore the balance, I said. To restore the balance, yes. And what happens if I become the good one? You couldn't possibly understand, but you will become far more powerful than any man or even many gods such as myself. You will become magnificent. Can you imagine becoming God himself? Of course you can't, but let me show you with the briefest glimpse. I can't describe what happened next, except to say that I suddenly saw everything all at once. I saw a proton circling a nucleus, not that I had even heard those words since high school, which was really Earth circling the Sun, which was really this galaxy circling a sort of mega galaxy, which is really our universe circling every other universe. I saw all of history, of which human beings were as small or smaller than a single proton. At the same time, I saw each individual human being, clearly, and knew everything about them. I saw an infinite number of futures sitting on the horizon, all to be shaped by me. It was something like that. What about my family? I asked, shaking out of it. Will I get to go back to them? You will see them forever, in all of their forms, and have control over their destinies. Will I get to kiss my wife again, as a human being? Will I get to read my daughter a dumb book before night-night? You will be everywhere, said the small one. All of the time. I think you guys fucked up, I said. You're talking to somebody. It took me two years to buy a new coat after my old one had fallen apart. I'm not equipped to control the flow of the universe. It's all part of the balance, whispered the small one. It always has been. You will understand immediately once you answer the call. That call. Well, I'll tell you what it sounds like to me, I said. It sounds like bullshit. You can't refuse. You have never refused before. Watch me, I said, and I threw the ringing phones to the circle of bare ground that I had cleared. Then I turned around and headed back to where I came from. The trudge back through the woods was awful. In addition to getting scratched to hell by branches, I kept expecting my head to explode, or the devil himself to appear in front of me and tear my throat out. But nothing weird happened, at least not during that walk, and I made it through more or less intact. I emerged from the woods and saw Detective Benson's SUV parked there. High up behind it, I saw the moon. It was supposed to be a full moon, but it really looked like part of it was missing. I don't mean around the edges, I mean right in the center. I shuddered, and then looked away. 
I shone the flashlight in the window of the SUV. Benson was there, normal size, with his eyes closed in the driver's seat. He was breathing, I saw. I opened the door, got in the passenger seat, then reached over and honked the horn. Benson's eyes shot open. What? You dozed off there, buddy, I said. Benson looked at me, lit up by the overhead light that had turned on when I had opened the door. What the... What the fuck happened to you? He asked. Your face. Are you okay? It's nothing. I just took a little hike through the woods, got scratched by some branches, I guess. And? And nothing. Some assholes playing a prank. Look, detective, I'm really sorry I wasted your time here. How do you heat your house? Huh? You got a wood stove, a boiler, or what? A boiler? Said Benson, looking confused. Well, I'm gonna come by and give you a tune-up. That's what I do, free of charge. Uh, thanks. Least I can do. Now, can we get out of here? You sure you're okay? Asked Benson. Yeah, I said. I'm good. I didn't know if that was true or not, but I was ready to go home. On the drive home, I couldn't help but thinking, had I just doomed the universe? Would the moon disappear from the sky? Would the sky disappear? It hurt my head. When Benson dropped me off at my car, I looked back up at the moon. It was whole again. I figured that meant one of two things. One, they had found somebody else to be the good one. Or two, the whole thing had been something other than what they told me. Either way, I figured it was over and, sure, I cried a little bit out of relief. And if I'm wrong, and all of creation ends up collapsing on itself, well, sorry about that, guys. When I got home, Kim was right there, waiting by the door. As soon as I stepped in, she wrapped me in a bear hug. Is it really over? She asked. I think so, I said. She pulled away and looked me over. Jesus, honey, she said. You just got that coat, and now look at it all torn up. It's fine, I said. Sure, there were a few holes in it, but they were just superficial. They didn't go through the lining. We'll get you a new coat tomorrow, said Kim. And this time, I'm picking it out. Thanks for watching, and I hope you enjoyed today's video. I want to give a huge thanks to all of my supporters over at Patreon and YouTube memberships. Your support makes these narrations possible and I appreciate it a ton. If you'd like to join these lovely ghouls, you can head on over to my Patreon at patreon.com slash clancypasta or click the join button below to become a member. Through Patreon, you can gain access to extra videos, on-screen thanks in the end credits of every video, personal shoutouts in a special video once a month, autographed stickers, merch store discounts, exclusive Discord roles, and much, much more. And if you'd like creepy cool shirts, make sure to head on over and check out my official merch store, creepycoolshirts.com, for some awesome tees, hoodies, stickers, and more. Alright, thank you all for watching, and I hope you have a great night. Cheers.